my great pleasure to welcome Millennial Woes. Uh, Millennial Woes, I, I think, is just the kind of person that we want in the alt-right. He's just, he has a unique perspective. He's someone who is coming from somewhere. Uh, and he's kind of, I could say, millennial woes, and you could say that about me too. We're kind of the hipster whisperers. Uh, uh, we're able to reach people that I think would probably not be immediately associated with nationalism and race and so on. I, I think that is a really great thing. Millennial Woes has become a YouTube artist. Uh, his channel is a encyclopedia of his views and, and I think something that's really core to alt-right. So it's my pleasure to welcome Millennial Woes to MPI. Welcome. All right, I'm going to be talking about nihilism. And I should, oh, it's on, okay. I should say that I'm not talking about formal capital N nihilism. This is a frequent confusion. Is this microphone okay? It's kind of, it's kind of sounding scary. All right, okay. All right, so I'm not talking about capital N nihilism, uh, which is a field of philosophy which is, has its own merit. But that's kind of irrelevant to what we see in, the, in society today, Western societies. What we're talking about is the pervasive attitude uh, and it's not just in Western society, I should say. It is the result of modernity, of luxury, of abundance, of complacency, of detachment from necessity. And it's, it's elsewhere as well in the world. It's uh, in East Asia, for example. But obviously, we're going to talk about the West here. This attitude is encouraged in the young by the media, the education system, and even the church, <laughs> and certainly the entertainment industry. So before I continue, I want to describe the genesis of this speech. A few months ago, a young man got in touch with me on Facebook, and I think he was 18, he knew a girl, and I, I don't know what the relationship was, but he was trying to get through to her because she is very, what I call, small n nihilistic. So I suggested, well, get her on my ch ask her if she wants to come on my channel and do a hangout. Uh, she didn't want to do that, understandably. So I said to him, OK, get her to come up with a set of questions for me to answer, and I'll do them in a video, a reply video. And so she did. She's come up with six questions. So I was going to do this reply video, and then I thought, well, actually, it could make an, a, a good speech. So I'm going to attempt to make a good speech out of this now, working largely from notes. And uh, I'll just go through each of her questions and then summarize at the end. Now, her first question, bearing in mind this is a, I think, 19-year-old girl in America. And uh, I could go into the various attributes, but I think it's not really important. What I want here is to have a speech that any of you can use as a resource to show to your equally nihilistic friends and uh, as a sort of catch-all uh, answer to their, their aimlessness, the hollowness that they feel, but are only tangentially aware of. So I'm going to answer this girl's questions now. Six questions. Here's the first one. And I think it sets the tone quite well. Why should I care about a future that I won't live to see? Now, before I get to the answer, isn't it just amazing that we live in a world where a young person in one of the most advanced, probably the most advanced nation in the world, can ask such a question? And how, bad are we how badly are we educating our, our young, raising our young, inculcating our young into our culture? That they are left, and I know that they were, I, kn I know that I was at that age. So it's not... It's not a new thing. It's been going on for some decades now, but I think it gets worse and worse. And I, I actually think that with the advent of Trump, we may have reached, we may have passed peak nihilism. I hope so. Anyway, she asks, why should I care about a future that I won't live to see? My reply, 
because other people are important. Basic stuff, and yet it needs to be said. And entities outside of yourself, groups, societies, nations, enterprises, projects, are also important. You are free to not consider these things important, but that is a count against you, against your character. Because if somebody only cares about themselves, they are an unpleasant, narcissistic, self-absorbed, and egotistical person who will build unhappiness for themselves and win the lukewarm contempt of their peers eventually. But a more direct answer to the question would be this. Everything that you have, you have because other people had exactly the opposite of your attitude. You have inherited wealth, technology, traditions, systems, infrastructure, culture, and architecture, among many other things, from people who did care about a future that they wouldn't live to see. It is precisely this that gave their lives meaning. Nothing is meaningful if it is produced without sacrifice. And no sacrifice is possible without effort and pain. I'm sorry if this is sounding a bit black pillish, but I think it is the truth. Effort and pain are not the end of the world. We survive, we keep going, we regenerate. And your life would be empty, frankly, without effort and pain. So do not be afraid. Give your effort, endure the pain, make the sacrifice, create the meaning. That's my answer to the first question. That's why she should care about a future that she won't live to see. I hope that's comprehensive enough. Number two, why should I care about one race or culture more than another? The short answer, of course, is loyalty. Those other races and cultures are not yours. That does not mean that you shouldn't care about them at all, but you should see your own race and culture as your priorities because they belong to you and you belong to them. Again, this is stuff that needs to be said in 2016. Why do you belong to them and why do these things belong to you? Because of the historical threads maintained by your ancestors. Nobody else is going to look after your race and culture. They are your responsibility and yours alone. And you don't have the right, you don't have the option to abandon them. The third question, why should I bother worrying about moral, in speech marks, worrying about moral values if it doesn't really hurt anyone else? And apparently by moral she is mainly referring to sexual morality. Uh, interestingly, th this is quite apt because about a year ago now I did a video specifically about this, well I did several videos about this. And also, there was a, another one about bestiality. And uh, don't be scared, but that is a subject that fascinates me because <laughs> you, can, you can't explain, and this is kind of difficult, you can't really explain why bestiality is wrong. Can anyone? I'll shoot your answers down if you do, because I, I've, I've gone through them all. Um, this is the point, and I'll try to uh, get to it here. This is my answer to her question. Why should we care about things that don't harm people? Moral values, if it doesn't really harm okay. Moral codes identify not only behaviors that are actively harmful to people, but also behaviors that are what I call passively harmful. The consequences of such actions are not immediately detrimental, but their cumulative effect is to degrade the soul shrivel the spirit, weaken the will, and poison the mind. If you behave selfishly, you become selfish. If you sleep around like a slut, you become a slut. If you don't take other people seriously, you eventually become incapable of taking other people seriously. I really wish teenagers today knew this stuff, because 
to talk to them. This this stuff comes to them as like out of thin air. They they don't. It's another language. They don't realize this. Now the point is that we are affected by our own behavior. Our behavior colors us and shapes us at a deep level, which we might not be aware of. But the wisdom of our ancestors warns us of these dangers because they did some of the heavy lifting for us so that we wouldn't have to learn everything the hard way. The fourth question. How do you even know if things are going to get really bad? Nobody can see the future. Now, I answered this as a separate video because I thought it was big enough of a question that it could be dealt with on its own, so that's on my channel. The point is, things are going to get really bad. But we'll get to that, uh, back to that later. The fifth question. Excuse me. You talk about how your race, whites, may go extinct. But why does it matter? Your DNA will still exist in racially mixed descendants. What's so wrong with this kind of extinction? Now, this is a bit of a, an involved answer. It's true that race mixing has always happened. It might surprise some of the reporters here to hear me saying that, but I think everyone in this room acknowledges the way we came about. Um, and since race mixing allows new human groups to emerge, it undoubtedly played a vital role in our evolution. However, it is not a simple or benign process it's also not a necessary process, by the way. We have other options, much, much better options. But anyway, let's concentrate on this. It's not a simple or benign process. Mixed race children and mixed race groups of adults lack identity and belonging. This makes them more susceptible to depression, suicide, self-destructive behaviors, and rootless cosmopolitan nihilism. Also, race mixing en masse leads to the extinction of a group, or even two groups, because they've mixed. So what is wrong with that extinction? First, would you hold this attitude about a type of dog, or cat, or whale? Isn't it so bizarre that they never do? They talk about the disappearance of some subs subspecies as a tragedy. Yet when it comes to us, the human race, it's fine. Mix, mix, mix. It doesn't matter. Oh, I'll return to the notes. Everyone understands the value of these subtypes of species. From a completely detached universalist perspective, such as comes naturally and honestly to nobody, nothing really matters, since there is no concept, sorry, context for it to matter in. From a slightly more honest and less universalist perspective, what matters is that sentient life on planet Earth continues. From a still more honest and less universalist perspective, what matters is that the human species continues. And if one subgroup within it becomes extinct, that's not a terrible thing. From a detached universalist perspective. But you do not have that perspective. You're a mammal. You're not a moral or intellectual calculator. You're a human being. Now, as for why the extinction of an ethnic group matters, well, let's see if culture matters more. Culture matters, but I think it's of secondary importance here, and here's why. What is it to be a British person and I've chosen British deliberately rather than American for reasons that should become obvious. Is there a set of values or characteristics that makes somebody British? Civic nationalists would say yes, but they're wrong. Because you can't name these values. And anyone, every attempt to do so it just comes off as pathetic. It comes, it's delusional. How am I British? By holding which values or beliefs do I qualify as a Scottish person or a British person? There aren't any. There's drivel that my government pretends to believe in. There's drivel that I and other Scottish pe people are pressured to pretend to believe in. But all of this is nonsense. 
It doesn't matter what beliefs I hold. The reason I am British is that I am of that group. Genetically, ancestrally, historically, and culturally, and geogra geographically. I would love the British people even if they became communist. The traits and values they happen to believe in are not what makes them British. It is implicit, obscure, esoteric, nebulous. It is dreamlike, and it is self-justifying. It is a thing in and of itself. It thrives on its own momentum and exists for as long as it chooses to. The final question, number six. I have a job and I have a plan for my future. She plans to open a restaurant. And none of the stuff you go on about really affects that plan. So why should I care about any of it? Well, first of all, I would say to her, because I don't want to seem like I'm mocking her. She's 19. Everyone's confused at 19. So I would say, good luck with the restaurant. These things are important. We can't all be living in the clouds all the time. And yes, you derive your identity, you build your identity by doing things. So it's important, and I'm not trying to belittle that. But on the broader matter... I don't expect everyone to be a leader. Not everyone needs to be obsessing about the state of the world. And certainly not everyone should claim to have solutions for the world and to know how it should be changed. But I think everyone should care about the world, the state of the world. It affects us all. And every one of us has the ability to influence things and each other. Basically, and this is directed to the girl, Basically, I think you're waiting for someone to tell you to stop being spoiled, self-absorbed, and frankly, selfish. Your friends clearly haven't told you this, probably because they're also ensconced in the same nihilistic culture of the modern West. Your parents haven't told you it, and I think that's a shame, but I am telling you. And deep down, you know this stuff already. Your instincts are trying to tell you something but you haven't learned how to interpret those instincts. In fact, you've been trained in how to suppress them. So, start taking life seriously. Start realizing what matters, i.e. not just you, and become a better, more useful person. Now, is the camera okay? okay. To return to the matter of whether things are going to get worse, in the West in general, uh, unless circumstances change radically and deeply, and I'm not sure that Trump is quite capable of the kind of radical deep change that I'm proposing, but unless that kind of change happens, yes, things are going to get really bad. And therefore, you should start caring. Because apathy is the number one problem here. Apathy is the cause and the effect of the nihilism. The number one problem in the West today is that people have something like the following attitude. Nothing really matters. It's all about me. And I should suit myself and not think about the future beyond my death or the past beyond my birth. I don't care if my group ceases to exist. I don't care about what I leave for my descendants because I don't appreciate the fact that what I have came from my ancestors. Genetics and ancestry may connect them and me, but time and the assurance of the Jewish media separate them and me. In fact, I revel in feeling no connection to my ancestors at all and in not caring whether my descendants are even born. It's all about me. To which the obvious reply is, it isn't. It really isn't. Well, that's true on the one hand. Let's examine that first. It isn't all about you. You belong to a group, and you belong in that group. You are one part of a very long and ancient story. You are the descendant of thousands of years of evolution, of cultural development, of traditions, 
of religious and philosophical thought, of artistic exploration and genetic distillation. The language you use, the things you understand, the way you see the world, the ways you are able to see the world, the clothes you wear, the music you call your own, the architecture you are familiar with, the stories you know, the features of your face, the shapes of your bones and internal organs, and every single one of the 37 trillion cells in your body. All of these things attest to the fact that you are of this story. You are not alone. Your life is not meaningless. You don't have to start with nothing and end with nothing more than products. You are not an animal, and it is not just all about you. On the other hand, it is all about you, within the context I just described. You exist in a context of peoplehood, of history, of culture. That context is what makes you meaningful, more than a mere creature, a, more agglo a mere agglomeration of genes. The context which makes you meaningless is the one that you know today, the one that tells you that nothing really matters. It's all just arbitrary consumer choices, that you exist on your own and with infinite possibility and zero attachment. That is the context which divorces you from any meaning and from any possibility of the sacred. You are an individual, and that is precious. But you're also one member of a group, one part of a story. It does not in any way negate your individuality or your sovereignty as an individual to be a member of a group. In fact, it enriches your individuality and gives it meaning that you almost certainly cannot build on your own. It connects you in many ways, genetically, historically, but above all, romantically, to the past which created you and the future which will remember you, if you are to be remembered at all. And if you are to be remembered at all, it is most likely going to be by the inheritors of that which you own and look after today. Your descendants, your people, your birthright, your responsibility, your gift to the future, new generations of people who could be at one with you, who could recognize you, who could understand you at a spiritual level. This is how all people used to live. You, the millennial or Generation Zer of 2016, have been reduced to market choices. These are arbitrary and meaningless. The identity you were born with and into is neither arbitrary nor meaningless. It is sacred and bursting with meaning. See beyond your immediate context, the one that is fed to you from your smartphone and the strip mall, and recognize your place in this great, soul-nourishing and life-affirming situation. And if you do so, and if everyone does so, then we can cure our culture, raise our spirits, increase our birth rates, save our peoples, regenerate Western civilization, and resolve all of our various, numerous, but ultimately defeatable millennial woes. Yeah. Thank you.